Hi, my name is Jack Rackham, and today I'm going to share with you the family tree of Portuguese monarchs. We'll be following along with the European Family Tree West chart, available in poster form at usefulcharts.com. Now one thing you'll notice very quickly, looking at the first Portuguese king, Alfonso I, is that he reigned at the same time as the Spanish king, Alfonso VII, and that above both of their names is the House of Burgundy. This is quite the coincidence, and I genuinely do mean that. You might expect, with the close proximity of Spain and Portugal, that this was one royal house that came to power in both countries, like the French Bourbons and the Spanish Bourbons, or the Spanish Habsburgs and the Austrian Habsburgs. But in fact, these are two totally separate families. You see, at various points in the Middle Ages, there was a kingdom called Burgundy, but in the 12th century, that land had been divided. The parts of the kingdom inside of France became the Duchy of Burgundy, and the parts inside the Holy Roman Empire became the County of Burgundy. The Spanish House of Burgundy descended from the County, and the Portuguese House of Burgundy came from the Duchy. You might rightly wonder, how did a French duke come to rule over Portugal? Well, you might be familiar with the centuries-long conflict between Muslim and Christian rulers in the Iberian Peninsula known as the Reconquista. When Emperor Alfonso VI called for help, one of the French duke's younger sons, named Henry, won some important victories and as a reward was given the county of Portugal and a princess's hand in marriage. When Henry died in 1112, it was actually his wife Teresa who ruled the county until Afonso and a group of unhappy nobles led a rebellion against her in 1128. But of course, that wasn't all. The county of Portugal was under the control of the Kingdom of Leon, until Afonso declared independence in 1139, needing not just to defeat a larger kingdom, but also to get the Pope to recognize his independence. We've also got here one of the earliest designs of the Portuguese coat of arms. Anyway, Alfonso I was succeeded by a son, who built up the new kingdom's administration and its treasury, and then a grandson, who devised the first set of Portuguese written laws, and got himself excommunicated. He was followed by a very unpopular king, Sancho II, who was deposed and replaced by his younger brother, Alfonso III. He conquered the southern region known as the Algarve, and so later kings of Portugal were known as King of Portugal and the Algarve, later Algarves, plural. The charmingly named King Denis married a saint from Aragon, and some of his children and grandchildren would marry into what became the Spanish royal family. He only had two legitimate children, Constance and Alfonso IV, and thankfully that one son lived into adulthood, becoming known as Alfonso the Brave. His heir was King Pedro I, or Peter in English, who was one of the three Peters all ruling in the Iberian Peninsula at the time. There was Peter IV of Aragon, King Peter of Castile, and Peter I of Portugal. One way you can remember this Peter is that he was called Peter the Just, although his brand of justice could be a little extreme. He had a love affair with a woman named Ines, and after his first wife died, he married her in secret. His father, growing old and concerned about the political implications of this marriage when Pedro became king, had his wife assassinated. Pedro reportedly captured the assassins and personally tore out their hearts. He was also known as Peter the Cruel. However, the names themselves won't help you too much in telling apart the Peters, because King Peter of Castile was also known by the same two nicknames. King Fernando I had an interesting impact on history. Over in Castile, there was a civil war between Peter and Henry II, and in the middle of all that, if we go over to the English family tree for just a moment to visit John, Duke of Lancaster, he wanted to use his marriage to a Castilian princess to stake his own claim to the throne. Fernando I supported John, and so England and Portugal entered into an alliance, which has remained intact to this very day, the longest alliance in history. The situation in Castile eventually resolved itself with the rise of the House of Trastamara, and there were later talks of combining Castile and Portugal when Fernando's daughter married John I, 
that alliance with England might not have lasted so long if that had been the case, but it never came to fruition, because Fernando I was succeeded by an illegitimate half-brother, John. Or João, which, if I've managed to pronounce it properly again, usually manages to get a kick out of Portuguese-speaking viewers. This started the House of Aviz, which came from the name of a military order that John belonged to. He's known as John the Good because he's remembered for fighting for Portuguese independence during the brief interregnum of 1383 to 1385. And, I should mention, that nickname actually does distinguish him from John of Castile and John of Aragon, who both reigned at the same time, as well as the later John II of Castile, who also overlapped with John the Good. It was also during John's reign that the Portuguese captured the city of Ceuta in northern Africa, marking the beginnings of the Portuguese Empire, the kingdom's peak of power overseen by the House of Aviz. John had two important sons. First, there was Prince Henry the Navigator, who initiated the so-called Age of Discovery, but only his son Duarte became king. After him was Afonso V, who began to acquire more lands in North Africa, and then we get his son, John II. John II is often considered the greatest Portuguese monarch of all time. Under his reign, Portugal explored further around Africa and into Asia, and in fact, he was the one who signed the infamous Treaty of Tordesillas. That's the one you've probably heard of that drew a line across the world and declared that all newly discovered land on one side of the line and all the people living there would belong to Spain, and everything on the other side and all the people living there would belong to Portugal. The family line was shaken up a bit by the fact that John's heir died in a horse-riding accident, and so the throne went to his cousin, Manuel I. In Manuel's reign, the Portuguese landed in Brazil, and his son John III established a colony there. John III outlived his son, leaving the throne instead to his grandson, King Sebastian, who died on the battlefield in Morocco. He's sometimes called Sebastian the Sleeping, or Sebastian the Asleep. There's an exceptionally old and amazingly pervasive myth across cultures that talks about how a beloved king that everyone thought was dead, especially if he died young or in battle, is actually in some sort of stasis, like sleeping in some faraway mountain, ready to wake up again when his country needs him most. In England, that's King Arthur, and in Portugal, that's Sebastian. Because he was young and childless when he died, the crown skipped back up two generations to King Henry, who had made it all the way up the ladder of the clergy to the position of a cardinal. But being a cardinal, he was celibate, and so the kingdom was staring down a succession crisis. There were several claimants who fought for the throne, but the ultimate winner was Philip II of Spain, the very man who had urged the Pope not to release King Henry from his vow of celibacy. Not that it would have made a great difference to the king who was in his 60s. For about 60 years after this point, Spain and Portugal were merged in what's known as the Iberian Union. For those of you wondering how this gels with the Anglo-Portuguese alliance I mentioned earlier, well, it's sort of glossed over for two reasons. First, Portugal was simply not an independent state at the time. Second, there were various factions within Portugal who were still friendly to the English, including a member of the House of Aviz who fought a war with England against Spain, the one with the famous Spanish Armada in it. Over the time of the Iberian Union, the power of the Habsburg dynasty in Spain had begun to decline, and history sort of repeated itself. A bunch of nobles were unhappy with the way Spain was ruling Portugal, and so they gathered around John, the Duke of Braganza, who was a distant descendant of King Manuel I. He had three sons who survived childhood, but his oldest didn't make it much further than that. His second son, Alfonso VI, ended the War of Independence against Spain, which had gone on for 28 years, but his poor physical and mental health had his brother Pedro II declare him unfit to rule and seize power for himself. Pedro II nearly went to war against England over the matter of Spanish succession, but was persuaded to switch sides before they came to blows. John V is known as the Portuguese Sun King, indulging in great levels of wealth, prestige, and absolute monarchy in the style of Louis XIV of France. He was followed by his son Jose I, and then in 1777, Portugal had its first reigning queen, Maria I. She married Pedro III, who was also her uncle. 
Technically, they were co-monarchs, but he was never really involved in matters of government. Now, she ruled through the entirety of the Napoleonic Wars, and when it became clear that Napoleon's forces were going to take the capital, the Portuguese royal court did something interesting. They neither fought to the last, nor capitulated. Instead, they packed up their things and simply came to Brazil. Even after Napoleon was defeated, Maria and her family remained in Brazil, probably because she suffered from dementia. After her death, John VI moved the court back to Lisbon in 1820, and here things get interesting. Brazil had recently been elevated to the status of a kingdom, and John's son Pedro, whose full name was, let's see if I've still got it, Dom Pedro de Alcantara Francisco Antonio Juan Carlos Xavier de Paula Miguel Rafael Joaquim José Gonzaga Pascual Cipriano Serafim de Paganza e Bourbon, was slated to become the next king of the United Kingdom of Portugal and Brazil. However, and I have a video on both Brazilian monarchs on my channel that explore this in more depth, there was a growing movement for independence in Brazil, and in fact, Pedro chose to ally himself with the Brazilian people and declare independence from his own father. There was only one more monarch after him, Pedro II, who reigned for more than 50 years, but despite a largely successful reign and a great deal of popularity, he was deposed by a group of military leaders, and he refused to support any attempts to restore the monarchy. Today, there are two of his great-great-great-grandsons who claim to be the current heir to the Brazilian Empire. That's Prince Louis and Prince Pedro Carlos. There was actually a referendum in 1993 held to determine whether or not to restore the monarchy, and a little over 10% voted in favor, an impressive number in my mind for a monarchy of only two men that ended over a century ago. That said, it's unlikely we'll see the return of the Brazilian monarchy anytime soon. Returning now to Portugal, after John VI died, Pedro I, despite declaring independence, was still given the crown of Portugal by his father. But he quickly abdicated in favor of his daughter Maria, with a plan for her to marry her uncle Miguel. But Miguel wanted to be the reigning king, and not another glorified king consort, and this led to a civil war, with Pedro emerging as the winner and Maria II as queen. Maria II ended up marrying a member of the House of Saxe-Coburg and Gotha, the currently reigning House of Belgium and the United Kingdom. Following traditional naming conventions, these remaining Portuguese kings would be a part of the House of Saxe-Coburg and Gotha as well, but the house name was officially kept as Braganza. Maria was followed by her son, Pedro V, and then her son, Louis. Louis was followed by his son Carlos, who in 1908 was assassinated, along with his firstborn son and heir. His second son, Manuel II, therefore became king, but he reigned for only two years, and then revolution broke out, and Portugal became a republic. Manuel II survived the revolution and lived out the rest of his life in exile in London, but he did not have any children. In fact, there are no living descendants of Queen Maria II. There are those descendants of Pedro II we mentioned earlier, but that side of the family gave up their claim to the Portuguese throne with Pedro I. So any possible heirs would have to come from the line of King Miguel, the most senior of whom being Duarte Pio, who married another member of Portuguese nobility and has three children. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is a complete history of the Portuguese monarchy. If you want the full chart, I'll once again remind you to check it out at UsefulCharts.com. If you'd like to learn about some of the other families here, or other history-related topics such as who would be king today in defunct monarchies around the world, or some of the timelines in Matt's new book, I highly recommend browsing some of our curated playlists on the channel page. Thanks for watching.